prayer. Wondrous God, we give thanks to you that we might come on this fourth Sunday of Advent to sing with Mary her song that magnifies your holy name. May we hear that song and its context. May we receive the word from Mary that shares life with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and told her that God had chosen her to bear a child, saying, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. After Mary heard Gabriel's message, she had a choice. She could accept the mission or she could turn it down. Because you know, God does give us choices. It's not forced upon us. We get to choose if we're going to respond to God or not. And although Mary could have said no, she did say yes. Even though, as you read the passage, she did ask some good questions about how this was all going to work out. After all, she was a young woman, she wasn't married, and how was this all going to work out? But despite all of the questions, she said yes. Now, it might have been with fear and trepidation, but she chose to take on her vocation of being the mother of Jesus who would be called the Son of the Most High. Like other prophets called into God's service, Mary received her calling with a great deal of humility, but also with resolve. When God asked who would go out and speak God's message to the king, Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. But not before he confessed that he felt a bit unworthy of the calling. He didn't know how he would do it, but he finally says yes to the call of God. And the same was true of Jeremiah and other prophets. And it was also now true of Mary. Despite their concerns about their qualifications, they took up the prophetic mantle and shared God's word with the world. After Mary said yes to God's calling, she became pregnant with the promised child, and then quickly set off from her home in Nazareth to the home of her relative Elizabeth, who lived in the hill country of Judea. Elizabeth was the spouse of Zechariah, a priest. And according to Luke, like Sarah and Hannah before her, she was beyond the age of childbearing when she became pregnant. Yes, she wasn't supposed to get pregnant, but she did. That's the way God works in the Bible, you see. The angel of Gabriel appeared to Elizabeth's husband, who, while in the temple, received the unlikely news that his wife would bear a child, who, like Elijah, would be a prophet of God and prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. So that's Elizabeth's story. Mary, on the other hand, was probably only a teenager when she received her calling. Luke tells us that when Mary arrived at Elizabeth's home, Elizabeth's child leapt for joy in her womb. When she felt this stirring in her womb, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. When Mary heard Elizabeth's words of blessing, she also was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to sing God's praises. She magnified the Lord. The, the re rendering we used this morning has it a, a little bit different, but, she, but the traditional word is magnify, which is, comes, which is translated into uh, Latin or translated from Latin as magnificat which is that blessed uh, song 
Um, that's where the, the, the words come from. We know this song, there's multitudes of, of um, renditions of it. And it just is an inv- invitation to hear Mary's song of praise to God b- with a prophetic turn to it. You see, as one commentator pointed out, these women, and you could say that, uh, that since there's a similarity between this song and Hannah's song, that Elizabeth could have sung it as well. So regarding this, one commentator points out these women could be 8th century prophets for the way they understand God to be emphatically on the side of the poor, the hungry, the weak, and the sad. Yes, the songs that come from Mary's lips and perhaps from Elizabeth's as well echo the themes of Amos, Micah, and Isaiah. There's a tendency, though, for us to jump too quickly from the person who sings the song to its message of justice. But let's not forget the messenger whose life provides the context for this song. Think about the connection between Elizabeth and Mary and between the two children still in their mother's wombs. Elizabeth and John fulfill their prophetic calling by pointing the way to Mary who rejoices that God has chosen her and her unborn child to be a blessing to the world. This is a most appropriate song, therefore, for us to sing in Advent, because Advent reminds us of John's prophetic vocation to prepare the way for the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Protestants have a tendency to downplay Mary's role in the Christian story, which may be why we jump so quickly from Mary to the word of justice that is in that song. But I think that we might want to take this opportunity this morning to invite Mary back into the center of the story. We can join Elizabeth in calling her blessed, In fact, we might want to join the majority of the Christian world and call her the God-bearer, which in Greek is Theodicus. That term, Theodicus, emerged out of conversations in the 4th and 5th centuries when the early church was debating about how Jesus might be both divine and human. And while many in my circles tend to emphasize Jesus' humanity, which is a good thing, that's not a bad thing, it's a good thing, Maybe there are other witnesses to be heard. Another witness about Mary being Theodicus and what that means for our understanding of who Jesus is. And that witness in the Gospel of John declares that the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us, revealing to us the full nature of God. And Mary, according to the Scriptures, is a partner in that process which is exactly why the early church called her Theodicus. Disciple theologian Joe Jones believes that if we let go of this witness, we lose something important. He writes that the real miracle is that God becomes human flesh through being born of a Jewish woman. The important matter here is Mary's election by God to be the bearer of the one who, in the words of Gabriel, will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. She is the one, for whatever reason, God chose to bless, and through her blesses us. Jones writes, it should now be fully clear that creaturely bodiliness, that's not easy to say, creaturely bodiliness is not alien to God, but is assumed by God, and lovingly embraced by God, not just in possibility, but in concrete act. As we hear Mary's song, which erupts during her pregnancy in response to Elizabeth's words of blessing, may we remember Mary's role in partnering with God's work of redemption. Mary reveals to us God's vision of a world turned upside down, where the proud are scattered 
the powerful are brought down from their thrones, and the lowly and the hungry are lifted up, and that her son would be at the center of this work. There is much about Mary's story that is a mystery, but here at the beginning of the story, we hear her magnify the Lord and rejoice in God her Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. This morning, we have heard Mary proclaim the blessings that come when the realm of God is fully revealed. Having heard this proclamation, may we celebrate with Mary her calling to partner with God in setting in motion God's work of salvation, liberation, and reconciliation. And that's because Mary is the one whom God chose to bear the child through whom and in whom God is revealed to humanity. God issued the call. And Mary said, Here am I. Send me. Now, she may not have used those exact words, those words from Isaiah, but they express her sense of call. Because she was willing to answer the call, even though she was young and her station in life was lowly, we can join the nations and call her blessed according to the promise made to Abraham and to his descendants forever. As we leave here today, we move from that town in the hills of Judea, where Mary resided in the house of Elizabeth, to a stable in Bethlehem, a town that, according to the prophet Micah, is but one of the little clans of Judah. But from you shall come forth for me, one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. In this little town of Bethlehem, where the dark streets shineth, the everlasting light, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. The time for us to celebrate the birth of Jesus is near at hand. But for now, let us take heed of the words of Mary, the God-bearer, who cries out like an 8th century prophet, expressing God's vision of God's realm, where justice and peace will reign, and the glory of God will be revealed in Mary's child. May we, as God's people, join with Elizabeth and John, and declare of Mary, Blessed are you among women, and blessed be the fruit of your womb. And according to Luke, Mary remained with Elizabeth for three months, perhaps until the birth of John, and then she returned home to Nazareth to pack for the trip to Bethlehem, where Jesus would be born. I invite you to move toward that day tomorrow when we will share in the glory of that birth story. But for now, let us reaffirm Mary's song. And I invite you to stand and sing hymn number 130, My Soul Give Glory to My God, which is a rendition of the Magnificat.